Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad that you are with us this morning as we worship and praise our awesome God. If you're visiting for the first time today, welcome. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, will you stand and join us in a responsive call to worship following the words on the screen? We stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, rejoice in the Lord. Again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. We, we who serve, serve God by his spirit, who boasts in Christ Jesus, we put no confidence in our flesh, nor in our own ability. Rather, we boast only in the power of God, which is at work in us. People of God, what have we that could ever be of such great I gotta get my glasses checked. <laughs> Let me start again. People of God, what have we that could ever be of such great value as Christ Jesus, our Savior? We, we boast in nothing except, except Christ Jesus, Jesus, our Lord. We need no gold or silver or precious jewels, for we have the full riches of God in Christ Jesus, his greatest gift to us. People of God, what if this world suggests that Christ, our treasure, is worthless and void of any value? We will shout and we will sing, Christ, our Savior, is all we ever need. He is our hope and stay. He leads us along life's difficult way. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for the grace to know you more. Let's sing together this way. Love in all your words. 
prayed this way. He said, listen to my words, Lord. Consider my meditation. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for I pray to you. Because you see, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence, but I, by your great love, I can stand in your house. And so I bow down in reverence. Oh, Lord, lead me in your truth. Let's sing together.
Please be seated. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God tells us that in heaven, it's literally at the name of Jesus that the angels and the elders fall down around the throne and they give God glory. Literally at the name of our Savior. Let's sing together. At your name. Father God, there is no name in all of created order. There is no name that we've ever known. There's no name that's ever been spoken like your name. 
Yahweh, you are the God of all creation. You are the God of all things. You are the Lord of all lords and the King of all kings. And so, Father, this morning, we come to give you praise and thanks. What an amazing, beautiful day you've given us, Lord. We're so glad to be together here in worship. And we just pray that you'll gather our hearts now from the places and the spaces we've been under your word this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning once again. We're so glad that, well, that was kind of weak. Let's try again, huh? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, what a great day it is, right? The beautiful, beautiful day. And you know, how many churches can you go to? You get to sit with the windows open and hear the the birds and the fresh air. I mean, it's awesome. So we're so glad you're with us this morning for worship. I want to share just a couple of quick announcements with you all. We want to remind you that next Sunday is our baptism Sunday. So don't come to this room for worship. We're going to be in the beacon room on the other side of the building. And we'll celebrate with Sandy. uh, And who knows, maybe someone else will come forward uh, for baptism. And it's going to be a great day of worship. So please join us there 10 o'clock in the beacon room on Sunday. Also, the following Sunday, uh, which is uh, May 30th, we are going to be having our community a Memorial Day observation service, so we're observed, you know, it's not actually Memorial Day, but we're going to observe it on Sunday at 10 o'clock here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church, open to the community, we'd love to have folks come and join us, and we will have a family picnic to follow with hamburgers and hot dogs and chips and cookies, um, and speaking of chips and so forth, uh, the folks who are putting the picnic together um, would like your help with something. So the chips we're going to be using are these individ- they're individually packed um, bags of chips. Uh, these particular ones go very, very well. They're made by Frito-Lay, and they come in a 18-bag pack. Um, there's either a red bag or a blue bag. Doesn't matter. But if you would like to help donate some things for the, uh, for the picnic, we would love to have a bunch of bags of these. We're not, we, it doesn't matter how many because we're going to use them throughout the summer for our other picnics. But if you could, if you could pick up a bag of these, this big bag of individually packaged uh, chips, that would be super helpful. The other thing that we could certainly use for the picnic is bottled water. So if you could grab a a 12-pack or whatever of um, the 16-ounce bottles, the regular size bottles, um, we would love to to take those and use them for the the picnic. We're going to use them throughout the summer. So again, if we get extra, it's no big deal. Uh, But Joyce and Jeannie and Jill and the rest of the First Connections team are working hard to put this this, um, picnic together and could sure use your help with those two things. Now, here's the deal, though, right? We need them by next Sunday. So you have a week, (laughs) okay? We need them by next Sunday because if we don't have enough, we need to go out and purchase some. So please, if you can, um, pick up a bag while you're at the store this week or uh, some some water and bring it with you next week. That would be great. We're going to stockpile all of this in the coat room. All right, so when you bring them, you don't have to ask, where do I put them? We're just going to put them in the coat room, okay? And then we'll take care of them from there. So if you can help with that, we would greatly appreciate the help with for that. The other thing um, that we could use your help with is on that same day, May 30th, we are having our cookie, cake, and pie auction. And we've got some great volunteers who have already signed up. We just wanted to give you one more chance. If you'd like to sign up to bake something for that auction, Please do that today at the Welcome Center, okay? We need to know how many folks are, are planning to bake so we can prepare the rest of the pieces of the auction. So um, we would love to have you help with that uh, if, if, you're, if you're able. I think that's the announcements for today. Oh, I guess one other quick announcement. Hopefully, as you came into church today, you noticed things were just a little bit different outside. Um, and yesterday... We had a 11 and a half hour work day um, and got a lot of amazing work done. Um, and so what we were able to do is we removed all of those rotting uh, timbers that were on that side of the building and we seeded it over. It's going to be beautiful when it's grass. We uh, planted a flagpole, which is super cool. We've been wanting to do that for a long time. Uh, we put rock around the, the main garden on that side of the church. We seeded over here along the east side, and then we've prepped 
We've done the first level of prep of taking away those old rotting timbers on this side as well. Tons of work, um, and I'm not even going to name the folks who are here, but it's just very much appreciated. And so if you see some of us walking around today with a little limp or something, that's why. Um, but it was a great day. We give lots of glory and praise to God for keeping the rain off. I know we need rain desperately, but we just didn't want it yesterday. <laughs> so it was good. And uh, thank you to everybody who came to help yesterday. With that, uh, let's turn our hearts to prayer. And Bob and Lori, will you lead us in prayer? I'll leave my uh, slightly injured wife <laughs> so she doesn't have to get up. Well, let's, uh, let's bow before our, our Father this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, the beautiful sun, the rain to feed the trees and the flowers and the grass. We look outside and we're amazed at the beauty that you've given to us every single day. We thank you for this place, Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together here in this space and to be with and fellowship with one another. We also thank you, Father, for the leadership of the church. We thank you for Pastor Jeremy and Sarah, the, everybody that makes these services run smoothly. We thank you so much for them and all the hard work that they do. Um, we also ask for strength for your gospel, um, for the ministry in this place, and for the ministry in the community. We also ask for uh, your love, your compassion for all those who are sick, for those who may be in need of surgery, who are recovering from surgery, um, who are uh, shut in at their homes and cannot be with us uh, to worship today, we ask for special prayers for them. We also ask for your Holy Spirit to be with those who have lost loved ones, those who are grieving, those who are struggling with depression, anxiety, or loneliness. We ask, Father, to send your love your Holy Spirit, and to keep the flame of the love of you, Father, in their hearts. We also ask in prayer for those who must go without shelter, food, or even life's simplest necessities. We know that you will take care of them. So we pray now for the service for the gathering here, we'd ask that you open our ears, our hearts, and minds to hear the word that you have for us today and that it rightly applies in our lives. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.
But as we come to hear God's word this morning, would you, wherever you are, stand as we read together, giving God's word its full authority in our hearts and our lives. This morning we read from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 7, starting at verse 13. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word to us. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, our text that we're taking up today, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, contains just one very simple command for us. Enter through the narrow gate. Enter through the narrow gate. You know, as I was preparing for this message over the last couple of weeks, I came across an image which, frankly, I think probably teaches us perfectly everything we need to know about Jesus' word picture today. Remember, we're listening to and hearing Jesus build these word pictures and paint these pictures. And so here's the image that I came across. It's a very interesting image. I wasn't able to discern exactly who the artist of this illustration is, but it is certainly one which has kind of that feeling about it that's reminiscent of like Norman Rockwell, right? It is part of a larger collection of cartoons that's called the 50 most influential cartoons in all the world. That's about all the information I could find on it. Nevertheless, this artist is spot on with his or her representation of Jesus' powerful command, he's, if you look closely, and I don't know if you guys will be able to read it, but if you look closely, on either side of that pole that he's holding, we have a, a pack on one side and we have a bucket on the other, or a basket on the other. On one side you'll find these words written, sensuality, pride, deceit, and covetousness. And on the other side it says self-love, and worldly ambitions. The most powerful part of this picture, though, I think is not so much those words even, but how this artist has depicted an incredible reality to us. There is always room in heaven for the sinner. There is never enough room for his sin. For me, the most incredible part of this picture is that pole. Because what stops this man from walking through that door is the width of that pole. The height and depth and length of his sin. Any attempt to bring the sinfulness of this world into the promise of eternal life, which we receive as a result of the incredible mercy and grace of our God, any attempt to bring our sin into eternal life is futile. It's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Therefore, Jesus con continues his Sermon on the Mount and he discusses the impact of sin on our eternal blessing. Unless we choose to lay down the trappings of this world, we fall down, we lay our crowns, right? Unless we are willing to lay down the trappings of this world, things like sexual immorality, boastful pride, deceitful lying, the unwillingness to rest in all that God has given us and be truly satisfied in him. If we refuse those things, we refuse his blessing. We have no eternity with Christ. The way to heaven happens only, exclusively, entirely 
as a result of man's walking what Jesus calls the narrow path and entering through what Jesus calls the narrow gate. We should count ourselves blessed beyond measure by the simple miracle that this old worn out tent, as Paul said it, should pass through the gate of Jesus called narrow. But so often, you and I desire so much more, don't we? We try and we want to sneak the baggage of this world into eternal life. Bible commentator William MacDonald addresses this very issue in his Believer's Bible Commentary. He wrote these words. He says, The Lord now warns that the gate of Christian discipleship is narrow and the way is difficult. But those who faithfully follow his teachings, and they will find the abundant life. On the other hand, there is a wide gate, the life of self-indulgence and pleasure. The end of such a life is destruction. This is not a destruction of losing one's soul, but a failure to live out the purposes of one's existence. So many folks, I think, want to take Jesus' commands, his comments here, out of context. They want to attempt to paint a picture far different from what Jesus really means. Man has so often attempted to suggest that it doesn't really matter, right, how you get to God so long as you get there. What you experience along the way, how long it takes you, so long as at the end of your life you find yourself at the narrow gate of heaven, you're good. The problem is this, finding ourselves at the narrow gate which leads to eternity with all, all of eternity with Christ, that's not some by chance kind of experience. Instead, not only is the gate that leads to heaven narrow, but so is the path. That leads to that gate. The path which leads broken sinners home is narrow. Now, does this mean that if you and I, if we fail, if we fall, will we somehow not find ourselves at the narrow gate? Do we have to hope that we would never, ever, ever mess up in order to get to Christ's narrow gate? The answer is no. But it does mean this for you and I. There is no point in trying to get to heaven through the wide gates. There's no point in wasting our time with the wide gates. Anybody can sloppily meander their way to the wide gates, having traveled this wide and reckless path along the way. But it takes purposeful intention, a certain kind of willingness, an incredible trust to persevere and endure when we pursue the narrow path of righteousness. And then we find ourselves standing at the narrow gate, which leads to eternal joy and peace. Eternity with Jesus follows after a purposeful intention to walk with him. Now, some people in our world would say that this perspective is an elitist perspective. It's an ex exclusive perspective, perhaps they would say it's a biased or prejudiced perspective. The world wants us to believe that it doesn't matter what road we choose. They all lead us to the same God and the same afterlife experience. Brothers and sisters, they don't. Here's how a web blogger, Carl Johnson, put it. In April of 2018, he wrote a blog post titled The Narrow Way. He says... The Mormons have their Jesus, who they declare is Satan's brother. Islam has a Jesus, which is just a great prophet and not the son of God. New Agers have a Jesus that is their spirit guide and just one of many gods. Occultists have a Jesus that approves of their occultic practices and is not the Jesus of the Bible who condemned their practices. 
There is the Jesus of the Roman Catholicism that is mean and unapproachable. Therefore, you need to go to his mother, Mary, and ask her to intercede for you. There is the Jesus of the immoral who, despite their lifestyle of fornication, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, they have erroneously believed he is pleased with them. Jehovah's Witnesses have a Jesus who they believe was God's first creation instead of the eternal existing Son of God. And there are many more. I tell you, there is only one Jesus, and he is revealed in the Bible, and all others are deceptions of the evil one who has deceived the whole world. And much deception is cloaked in religion, intellectualism, rituals, and things that are highly prized by mankind. I could just put a period there, say, thanks be to God, and that be the message for the day, right? There is only one Jesus. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. You want to get to heaven? You had better know Jesus. You had better love Jesus. You had better trust Jesus, confess Jesus, serve Jesus, strive to be like Jesus. There is no room for any other perspective. No other possibilities exist. What did the song say? Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. All we have is found in Jesus alone. In the statement of faith of this very church, Cornerstone Faith Community Church, we confess this. It says, we believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God. He existed since before the creation of the world. He is fully God, and yet because of his earthly birth, he is also fully man. He was given by God, his father, to be born of a virgin woman named Mary. This miraculous birth was made possible only by the will of God the Father working through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus lived a sinless life, perfect in every way, just as his father intended him to be. He was horrifically tortured and ultimately sentenced by the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate to die on a wooden cross. And three days later, he rose from the dead, victorious over sin, death, and hell, and later ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God the Father. The writer of Hebrews then tells us that Jesus now serves as our great high priest and as an advocate for us before the Father God. I think that's worthy of an amen, huh? That is the truth of Jesus. So I want to offer you this morning three quick realities that surround Jesus' teaching regarding this narrow gate. And these are three realities that I'm going to suggest to you today's society is upset with because these realities reject the norms, the social norms of today's society. The first one is this. Society doesn't like the fact that there are only two options, a wide gate or a narrow gate. And they further really don't like that there is only one right choice, which is the narrow gate. Even this truth, though, is wrapped up in this conditional application, right? Sure, there are two possible ways to get there, a wide gate and a narrow gate. But at the end of the day, you only get there if you choose the narrow path and the narrow gate. There is no alternative path when it comes to salvation. There is now, there never has been, there, there never ever will be. There is no other way. There is only one way. And that way, by the way, has a name called Jesus. In John 3 and 16, remember we read these words, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Okay, now what do we do with the son? That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Only one way. In John 10 and 9, it says, I am the gate. Well, who's the gate? Jesus is speaking. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. In Acts 4 and 12, Paul reminds us that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
Romans 10 and 9 says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And in 1 Timothy 2 and 5, For there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, mankind, the man, Jesus Christ. So, I guess I have to say this morning, call me exclusive if you must. Suggest that my perspective isn't inclusive if you must. But there is nothing that will ever change my mind. There is only one way that you and I will see heaven. And there is only one path that we have been called to walk in this journey as we wait for the Savior to bring us home to heaven forever. The the narrow path. The narrow path which leads to the narrow gate. That's the only way. And when I get to that gate, I will find there is room only for me. Not for my sin. You've been called to travel this narrow path too. You've been called to enter through the narrow gate too. The question, of course, is will you? The world wants you to believe that whether you enter through Muhammad or Buddha or one of the myriad of Hindu deities, all of the roads get you to the same place. But they don't. Don't fall for this trickery. You see, Satan desires to use the trick of deception to encourage you to believe, surely God, you know, he's loving, right? So surely God wouldn't be opposed to an easier path for me, his child. But nowhere in God's word did God ever promise this journey to be easy. In fact, he expects that our journey will be just the opposite. God knows that the narrow path that leads to the narrow gate is filled with thorns and rocks and enemies. And it seems to me that that's why, by the way, We hear Jesus make this incredible offer to all of us. You remember it? It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I want you to notice, it isn't the way, the path, or even the gate that Jesus promises to be easy. It isn't the load we're expected to carry that Jesus promises will be easy. To think back to that picture we saw at the very beginning of our time today. What isn't going to fit through the gate? The man's baggage. So what is it that Jesus offers to take from us so that we can have it easy? That baggage. Our sin. So you see, taking the narrow path isn't easy, but it is the only worthwhile choice. Because as Jesus said this morning, all of the other paths lead to destruction. The second problem society has with this, it is well summarized by a man named Henry H. Haley in Haley's Bible handbook. He says, many will be lost. Few will be saved. Many will be lost, few will be saved. You heard that correctly. Many lost, few saved. You would think if I'm going to stand up here, I'm going to say, everybody, you know, come on. You know, God wants you, right? In comparison with the number of people who will turn away from God, who will choose their own path, who will reject Christ completely, the number of those who will choose Christ and choose the narrow path and find themselves at the gate is remarkably small. And you would say to me, well, pastor, how can that be? After all, doesn't God's word tell us that, that Christ prefers the few, right? He wants all of his creation to be saved. Doesn't God leave behind the 99 in order to go after the one? And the answer to this is yes, yes, and yes. But even these truths have to be understood and applied within the framework of our human free will. God gave us a brain to think with, and as such, some people are going to choose to think contrary to God's will. And this greatly grieves our God, but he has to allow it. Because you see, in as much as God wants desperately for every single person in all of creation 
to come home to heaven forever with him, he more greatly desires that all of this creation, every single person, would of their own will and maybe a little gentle push by the Holy Spirit choose him. God wants us to want him. God needs us to need him. God loves us to love him. Each of these falling squarely on our own responsibility. Our response to God's offer of salvation is not a matter of God controlling our destiny. It is rather a matter of God affording us an opportunity to choose him to walk the narrow path and find ourselves at the narrow gate. Now, I would think as realists, right, we would all say, well, isn't God taking a risk there? Because have you met some people on this earth? I think he is taking a risk. Don't think for one moment that he doesn't know the calculated risk he's taking. Though. I think Matthew 7 and 21 sums that up for us. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Here's a great way to sum it up. God can and will save anyone. But not everyone will be saved. The number of the souls which will be lost is great in comparison with the number that will be saved. And we would be left with this question, why so few? Why so few? Here's the reason. It's from Scripture. The first reason that it is few is because they will refuse to confess and believe. Romans 10 and 9, again, it says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Some will choose not to do that. The second is because there are people who possess itchy ears. I have to say, in this time, in this day, in this world, there has never been a more appropriate and applicable passage of Scripture than what I'm about to share with you. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And so they won't be saved. And the third reason from Scripture is that they will have refused to listen to God's word, and they will have built their house on the sandy land. <laughs> Not that Sandy built her house on the sandy land, I'm just saying. <laughs> Hear the word of God, Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Few will be saved because they built their house on sandy land. Here's the third and final truth about Jesus' narrow way. And it is absolutely in opposition to the norms of our society today. The way of salvation is not easy and it must necessarily be hard if it is worth living. Think about all of the commercials, the advertisements you hear about making your life easier. Jesus never made a commercial about making your life easier. He made a commercial about taking your load and sharing the burden. William MacDonald concluded in his Believer's Bible Commentary, he says, To follow Jesus requires faith, discipline, and endurance. This difficult life is the only life worth living if you choose the easy way you will have plenty of company, 
but you will miss God's very best for you. Listen, uh, I want you to take it this morning from someone, and I, I know I'm taking a risk here because my parents are sitting here, and I'm going to, you know, what? Take it from somebody who only made it through high school and to graduation because of an incredibly generous and lenient high school faculty, okay? You get that? There is an easy way out of everything. There is an easy way out of everything. No matter what you're doing, don't let someone mislead you. There may always be an easy way out of everything, but very rarely is the easy way the right way. My dad used to say when I was trying to help him do things, well, I'd love to have you help me, but I don't want to do it twice. <laughs> Choosing to believe that every path on earth ultimately leads to God might seem like the perfect iteration of having your cake and eating it too. But I'd offer a buyer beware statement. If you think that taking the easy road is having your cake and eating it too, be careful. You might not be biting into cake. If following Jesus was easy, everyone would do it. If following Jesus was easy, we'd have to build a new building on this ground because we couldn't fit everybody in here. If following Jesus was trendy and cool, trusting God, believing Jesus, giving yourself completely to the movement of God's Holy Spirit, trusting him completely, that's what it takes. That's the narrow way. That's the difficult road. And that's why some refuse to hear. Some refuse to listen. Some refuse to confess, some refuse to believe, and I'm sad to say they won't be saved. But what about you and I? I love the fact that we have a little church because it means we have a little aisle. <laughs> I have brides that come in, they have this grandiose idea of like, you know, trumpet voluntary for hours while they're coming down with this, you know, some brides their train has been almost as long as the aisle. The point is this, the narrow path. As you walk out of here this morning, think about it. You know, Jesus says you can't take one step to the left or the right. You know why? Because you're going to end up in a pew. <laughs> the narrow way leads to the narrow gate. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this difficult word to hear. Thank you for the opportunity to boldly proclaim your gospel in a world that chooses to ignore it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak words that our world refuses to understand, rejects. Father, we need your help so desperately to stay on the narrow path. And let's face it, all of us want to see the narrow gate. We want to meet you, Father, at heaven. We want to stand before the mercy seat with Jesus Christ advocating for us. But Father, your word has told us that there is a narrow path that leads there. The truth is we're going to fall off the path from time to time. We're going to take the wrong turn. We're going to choose to do things our own way. And so, Father, would you then in that moment urge us to confess? Urge us to come before you and confess the foolishness of our own path. Get us off the wide path and back onto the narrow. Father, we know you can do this for us. We know that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you can make us able. Father, will you make it so for us today? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
you stand as we sing together by faith. By faith, we, we see the hand of God moving. By faith, we see the hand of God sisters as you prepare to go from this place this morning remember the narrow path leads to the narrow gate that doesn't mean that we won't slip and fall once in a while and that's why our God is there with grace and mercy to pick us up and help us dust ourselves off and get right back on the path that grace that mercy is what we send you forward with today and with the love of God our Father, the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit for you this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. Wonderful week, everybody.